So uh, today, myself, Venki, and uh, Abhishek are very excited to talk about the Delta Lake extension in Druid. So the, the, the talk outline is basically we'll talk about the motivation, like uh, why do you need the, this extension? Like uh, why do you want the Delta Lake tables into Druid? And what sort of use cases it enables? And then we'll go to the overview of the Delta Lake. Uh, what is Delta Lake? I mean, how does it work? Like uh, what are the internals of it? Like we'll briefly touch upon some of the internals. And then we'll also talk about like a uh, Delta kernel. It is basically a library that we are building to enable connect, uh, engines like Druid or uh, Trino. Uh, anybody who wants to read the, write the Delta like tables easier, they make their job easier. Uh, then we'll talk about like the, how uh, Druid Delta like uh, uh, integration is done. And uh, it's followed by the demo of how the connector works. And also we'll talk about the scheduled batch ingestion, like where you can periodically ingest the Delta Lake table data into the Druid. And uh, followed by, we we'll end the talk with uh, like a roadmap of like uh, what are the exciting features we are going to work on next. Uh, so just a brief introduction about the Delta Lake. So Delta Lake is like a table format. Uh, it enables asset transactions on a, a large data sets that are in the cloud, sto cloud object stores. So uh, before Delta Lake, the data sets in object store used to be like a, you have a directory, underneath the directory like you have a set of parquet file. And if you want to read the table, you just need to list the directory content and figure out like what are the files. But this created problems like when you are updating the table and also like while trying to read it. Like, so when you are updating the table, like you may have written some partial data that gets visible to the uh, readers. So this uh, creates a, a, a problem, I mean, where you have like the incorrect data. So with the asset transaction, the transaction capability like uh, that enabled by Delta Lake, you can automatically update the table so that way like you don't see uh, impartial or like incorrect data. So this basically ensures the reliable, reliability of the uh, data lakes. And uh, this is an open source project. It has been widely used in the adapt and production environment. So, about the Druid, I think um, most of you already know what Druid is. It is good at like uh, interactive queries on large set, large data sets. At, it, it enables uh, its own like uh, use cases like the uh, real time ingestion and subsequent query responses. Uh, so by combining these two, Delta Lake and Druid, you can get the best of the both of our like basically like uh, with the Delta Lake you get a reliable data management where you know that uh, your data set is reliably updated and uh, uh, it's correct and stable. And uh, with the, the data being ingested into uh, Druid, you can actually get the interactive querying and low latency responses that you can use it in use cases like uh, fraud detection or real-time dashboards, etc. So that is the main motivation like we, have, we developed the uh, connector. And uh, I'll talk about the next few slides about the Delta Lake. Uh, so here is like a brief slide about the Delta Lake and its uh, uh, ecosystem. It is, uh, it is used in production at a scale and reliably used like, uh, it's like more than 10,000 companies use it in production in everyday workloads. And uh, on, the, on the right, like you can see a basically like a, a diagram of like where, what are all the connectors that you can use to read or write Delta Lake tables. So you can have like a wide variety of connectors like the, there is a Trino, or like a Druid, Flink, uh, and also you have a uh, vibrant Python ecosystem like in Pandas and Das, like where you can read the Delta Lake tables. Um, all these are like done in open source. So now like let's dig into like how the Delta Lake internally works. Basically, I will go through a, like a series of queries uh, data, I mean, typical data engineering queries that you see and how the underlying data storage, uh, physical layout of the table looks like it. So here you have the simple query like where you are creating the table called orders, which are like a three columns and as a delta table, uh, and you are inserting like a three rows into it. So when the query completed, the physical contents look like something like this, like basically. So I will go through like what each contents means. Like basically you have a orders directory. Underneath that, like at the bottom, you have the, all the data files that you have created from your query. And uh, in the beginning, like you have a uh, something called like the underscore delta log, basically. So this is where like Delta maintains all its uh, metadata or like the transaction data. 
So that, that, this is a metadata that ensures like uh, all your uh, updates are like uh, reading everything is like uh, asset compliant. So um, under the metadata directory, you have you can see like uh, there is a 00 dot JSON. Basically, this is like uh, this is like a Delta commit file. It is created for every time you make an update to the table. This file is created. So this captures like what are all the changes this update has done to the table, basically. It captures the changes to that uh, as part of the update. So it, this is like a monotonically increasing uh, file. Like the uh, file name is like to, you start with zero and you go to one, two, and keep on going that until, uh, wait, keep on going that, that way. Like, so that way, like, so if the two writers are trying to write it, and uh, they both try to write uh, like a uh, 10 dot JSON, and only one of them is successful because we make use of the cloud storage putty, putty pops and uh, functionality so that only one of them is successful. And so that way like you get the multiple writers can reliably update the table. Uh, so if you go into the internals, like uh, what is stored in the commit file. So it is just telling that like uh, this commit is adding a two new, two new data files to the table. One is like the f1.parke and the other one is the f2.parke. So, if the reader like who wants to read the data, all it has to do is like basically go to the transaction log, find out the commit files, and read the commit file and see like what is happened, like what changes it the uh, commit file has done. Like so, in this case, like we only have like one commit file, zero dot JSON, and by reading that, like you know that like you need to read like the two parquet files in order to like uh, read the table latest snapshot. So this is how like to uh, simple create table with some data insertion works. Now let's go to like a little bit more complicated case like where you are actually deleting the data. So in this case, the query is like, uh, it's a delete query. You want to delete all the records that satisfy the predicate order key equal to zero. So your uh, existing table layout is shown there. And the update, once the query completes execution, the updates looks like something like this. So how uh, about the updates? Like so, at the bottom of the uh, update, uh, the uh, uh, bottom of the slide, like basically you see that F1 uh, slash updated. So this is basically the rewritten uh, file of like the existing data files that have the uh, rows that match in the predicate. For example, in this case, like the F1.parke has the uh, record the row that matches the predicate, and uh, that file is read and uh, rewritten by excluding the record that don't satisfy the predicate. So you write a new data file, and how does your transaction update looks like? So the 01.json, that's a transaction file. It tells you like, okay, so I removed the one of the existing data file, which is the f1.park in this case, and I'm adding a new data file. So this is basically reliably expressing, uh, expressing like what is the delta compared to like your existing state. So, I mean, how does the reader look? Uh, reader looks like it. So the reader again goes to the transaction log. So it uh, by reading the zero dot JSON, it knows that it needs to read two files. Then going to the one dot JSON, it knows that okay, so the F1 file is deleted, just cross it out, and then I need to read a new file called F1 slash updated. So basically, this is how the readers can work. So all all the reader has to do is like to figure out, go through the transaction log figure out like what are the parquet files, and then most engines have like some sort of parquet reader, which is like very common, so they can read or use the parquet reader to read the data. So this is, so far it is good, but uh, we, Delta protocol has been evolving very rapidly, and we are adding like many functionalities and performance improvement that involves like reading more than the, just the parquet files. So, I mean, why we need to add these one these features? Like, because it enables a new functionality as well as like uh, all the data engineering operations, like uh, delete and all those. We want to make them faster. So, I will briefly talk about like one example, like where uh, the reader gets complicated. So, one example feature is like the deletion vector. So, deletion vector is like a feature that improves the performance of like a delete, merge, or update queries. So in this example, like uh, the same query from the previous slide, you are deleting the record, and uh, without the deletion vector, it's also known as like a copy and write. You basically rewrite all the parquet files that have the uh, matching records that you want to uh, delete. 
But this will, could be a big problem, like suppose if you have like a terabyte table and 1% of the data matches the predicate records you want to delete. You will end up like reading a large data set and then uh, rewriting the new files. So that, re that takes up IO and compute time. So one approach is like basically, you don't rewrite the parquet file. You basically just to add an additional file called a deletion vector file that is associated with the, the data file. So that, can, that tells you like what particular rows are deleted from the parquet file. For example, like if the parquet file has like 200 rows and you deleted like the row 100 and the row 150, the deletion vector file, it just contains the 100 comma like 150. So basically just like a set of numbers, like uh, row indexes into the parquet file. So with that change, you write the deletion vector file and how does the transaction log look like? So if you look at the one dot JSON, uh, the transaction log says that, okay, I'm removing the, this parquet file, but I'm adding that parquet file back with a deletion vector. So like who, the reader that is reading this table, it has to know that like the parquet, when it's reading the parquet file, it needs to know that like, okay, I also have a deletion vector that I need to look at it and filter out the data from the parquet file that I read. So this gets complicated. Like, so this is like a one example of like how uh, the reading could get complicated. So, I mean, we need this kind of feature because this saves uh, like a huge compute and like uh, IO timelines. This is like very critical for like to, in order to realize the lake house vision. So, and there are like more features coming like the coordinated commits and like uh, uh, type widening and all those things like, so basically where it complicates like the readers, like where they need to know all the details. So we have, we have been thinking about this problem uh, for the uh, two years back like to, we realized like uh, the, the libraries that we had to read the tables, they're not evolving with the connector, I mean, they're not enabling the connector for faster development or like upgrade. So we took time to like uh, design uh, a connector at a high level, like where the connector doesn't need to know anything about the protocol. So that's the goal in mind. And uh, we, basically, uh, we basically provide a library so that library can be uh, used at both the planning side as well as it when you are actually reading the data that abstract away all the protocol details. Like so, for example, like to, in this case, like the, if the table uh, engine in this case could be like a Druid wants to read the table. I mean, it has its own extension like connector, and it asks the Delta kernel, "Hey, uh, Delta kernel, like a, I mean, I want to read this table." The kernel knows like how to read the delta log, I mean, uh, how to go through the, all the transaction log and figure out like what are all the files that it needs to uh, read and what are the deletion vector associated with that. And it returns like a opaque objects to the connector. So these opaque objects are think of like, like a file split. So uh, in, I mean, in the before deletion vector, it's just like a set of parquet files, but now like we have a parquet file and some additional metadata like the deletion vector and all those. So these opaque objects are like to the engine can uh, serialize and send them to like workers remotely. And the worker again asks the Delta kernel, uh, I want the data related to this particular uh, uh, split or like opaque object. And the kernel knows like to what exactly read the data and how to transform it. Like So in this case, like it can read the parquet file and also read the deletion vector and filter out the rows that are not needed. Uh, or if any additional column needs to be added, it can take care of adding those and then send the resultant data to the connector. So the, all the connector sees is like basically the logical data that, are, that conforms to the table logical schema. But underneath that, it does a lot of stuff. Uh, so the, whatever you see at the bottom of like the reading the log files or reading the parquet file, so the connectors have ability to substitute their own uh, readers and uh, uh, writers. So that's an extension they can do it, but it's for mostly for advanced connectors. So this is how like the kernel works and this enables lot of connectors to, a uh, lot of engines to develop connectors to read and write Delta Lake. And Druid is like one of the connectors like which we work closely with. And uh, next Abhishek will talk about like how we integrated the uh, Delta Lake into Druid and a demo here. Um, thanks, Venki, uh, for the uh, detailed insights into all things Delta. Um, so now that we have an understanding of all the transactional capabilities and features that Delta Lake offers, We'll see how we can leverage uh, the power of Druid into intra uh, using specifically uh, interactive and real-time querying capabilities to Lakehouse. Uh, 
So this slide here shows you uh, how the Druid and Delta Lake ecosystem work together using this extension that we built. It's the Druid Delta Lake extensions. So here, uh, up here in the, uh, up, everything on top of the kernel here, you see the uh, MSQ. We'll, we'll talk about how to ingest data using the multi-stage query engine, popularly known as MSQ. And with, with MSQ, the controller basically coordinates the query execution and delegates uh, work to all the MSQ workers. The extension basically interfaces with the kernel to get uh, all the data, read and interpret, all the complexities that Venki was talking about. And then uh, the kernel provides us with splits, these opaque objects, then, which is then distributed to these workers, uh, which then gets uh, ingested into Druid. So let's take an example of an example, uh, MSQ DML query that uh, a user would write. So here you see that it uh, shows the loading of an external delta table from an S3 bucket. It uses the S3 external syntax, ex external syntax to load the table specified at the table path. All you need is the user has to specify a table path. This uh, path can be an S3 or any blob storage for that matter. And uh, similar to uh, Atul's talk where he was talking about filtering capabilities, this uh, extension also supports uh, similar capabilities where uh, uh, folks are able to specify uh, filter predicates that are then pushed down to the kernel to prune out unwanted data. This is uh, especially particularly useful in like large uh, delta lakes. And uh, at this stage, you can also specify uh, you know specific columns that you want to project, extra extract JSON values from a complex uh, delta structure or array or map and so on, and then apply any transformations and uh, druid aggregations on top and ingest the data. So this is all good with a single in the context of a single DML ingest query. But let's say now uh, you, uh, we want a more automated approach to keep our delta lake tables and uh, Druid tables to be in sync. Uh, because delta, it's often more uh, common, to, it's more common to have the latest snapshot of the de delta lake table ingested into Druid. So how do we automate that process? So this is, uh, this is where uh, we'll talk about the scheduled batch supervisor that's under development. It'll help us automate this process by uh, ensuring that fresh data is ingested into uh, Druid in a recurring manner. So with the schedule batch supervisor, uh, this, as I said, it's a uh, new up upcoming feature in Druid which uh, will natively uh, uh, you, uh, let users in schedule DML MSQ tasks uh, at a predefined schedule, ensuring uh, data batch data ingestion. Think of it like a streaming supervisor, but for batch ingestion uh, input sources. So it's like more like a fire and forget mechanism where you, the supervisor is once the supervisor is set up, the uh, user doesn't have to like uh, do any sort of manual intervention for the most part. Uh, you know, just set up some uh, monitors and alerts and uh, to see the check on the health of the supervisor. And then uh, this also has uh, nice additions, like you can have multiple uh, batch supervisors scheduled for, uh, for the same table, giving you like the flexibility to have uh, different uh, data freshness requirements uh, based on your needs. And uh, a few other use cases that I've highlighted here, uh, you know, it's uh, replacing the entire delta table periodically with the latest snapshot using the delta uh, 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 filter. And then, and more broadly, outside of the Delta Lake ecosystem as well, this uh, helps with rolling up data into larger time chunks as the data ages, uh, which is usually useful for uh, you know, efficient storage and um, since querying is uh, over summarized data is much faster. So uh, this is what the query uh, batch, scheduled batch supervisor spec, JSON spec looks like. As you can see, it's, uh, there's like a scheduler config where, uh, in the JSON spec that uh, takes cron syntax formats. For now, we are adding uh, two, uni uh, two formats, uh, namely Unix and Quartz. Uh, and inside the spec itself, you see the query and then any other context that you would just normally uh, 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 specify if you were to directly submit an MSQ task. So uh, on the left here, I've seen on the left here, I, uh, you can see that uh, I'm submitting a, batch, a scheduled batch supervisor that replaces into the orders table, reading from a table path S3 foo slash orders, but it's partitioned by hour. And it, this uh, schedule kicks in every 30 seconds 
Uh, so the data remains fresh every 30 seconds. But now, if I want to roll up this table into, uh, into a larger bucket, I can also sch uh, schedule a separate supervisor into a different table, but at a daily cadence. So at the end of the day, uh, or at the beginning of the day, this table gets rolled up into a larger time chunk here. So, um, um, so, and then finally, so now that we saw the scheduled batch supervisor, we got a preview of it. Uh, there's only currently support for recurring batch ingestion where the supervisor just simply spare, uh, submits the uh, MSQ query as is repeatedly. But then we also plan to add some simple change detection uh, templating mechanisms that will let users incrementally uh, uh, ingest batch data from uh, batch input sources. So uh, in the context of the uh, Delta Lakes, uh, it'll, uh, there's also like plans to add change data feed inside the Delta kernel library, which lets us uh, read data that's changed between two consecutive snapshots or any two snapshots. So we should be, in the future, I'm uh, hoping that we could leverage uh, such capabilities to also uh, um, ingest only the necessary data instead of like replacing and re-indexing the entire table over and over again. Um, and, and yeah, I would like to thank all these folks uh, who've contributed to these extension and uh, web console support. Uh, and with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you. <laughs>